Parsha is called Bo. In Hebrew, it's Bo. In English, translated variously as go, enter, or come. And you'll see in the first verse exactly how they translated it here. Come to your own decisions is how it should be translated. Um, so this Parsha is where it's all been leading up to. The entire story up to this point has been leading up to the creation of Israel as a nation. So they can take them out of Egypt and become God's covenant people. So everything has been leading up to this point. The first verse says, And Jehovah said unto Moshe, Go in unto Pharaoh. So it can be entering unto Pharaoh, coming unto Pharaoh, going unto Pharaoh. But the King James translates it as go. Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him. And that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am Yahweh. Oh, Yahweh. <coughs> so it's actually changed. The focus has changed now. Instead of the plagues being for Egypt's benefit, for Pharaoh to see, Yahweh says at this point, these things are done so that you can see who I am so that now Israel starts to really wake up to who Jehovah is. And Moshe and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith Jehovah God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. So this is Moses speaking to the most powerful man in the world. Up to this point, Pharaoh is used to thinking of himself as a god. Moses has stood before him saying, God says, how long until you humble yourself before me? How long before you recognize who I am? Obviously, as all these plagues have been happening, it's been shaking Pharaoh's world somewhat. He thinks he's God. Now he sees that actually he hasn't got any of the power. All of the pantheon of gods that he's used to worshiping, they haven't got any power. All of the fallen angels have got no power at all. It's God, God of the universe. It says that Jehovah hardened Pharaoh's heart. One of the ways that he does it is he speaks to him in a way that he's not used to being spoken to. He says, how long will it be until you humble yourself before me? This brings a swelling of pride in Pharaoh. He says, let my people go that they may serve me. So he's not used to this at all. Now remember, Jehovah said he would give Moshe the words to say to Pharaoh. That's what he promised him. In Exodus 4.12 he says, now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. So these words that Moses is saying now to Pharaoh, they come directly from Jehovah, they come from the leading of the Holy Spirit. And people will say, people didn't have the Holy Spirit in the, in the Old Testament. That's not what the Bible says. In Isaiah 63, 11, it says, Then he remembered the days of old, Moshe and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up? out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock, where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? So Moses had the Holy Spirit within him. This was what was leading him to say these things, leading him to say to Pharaoh things that would challenge his pride and would harden his heart and would stop him from sending out the Israelites. Else if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring the locusts into thy coast, and they shall cover the face of the earth that one cannot be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped, which remaineth unto you from the hail, and shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field. So all of their livestock had been killed, the only source of food that they had in the entire country was the crops. And they shall fill thy houses, and the houses of all thy servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy father's fathers have seen since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the man go, that they may serve Jehovah their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? So these are Pharaoh's servants that are actually talking to him like this at this point. They're saying, look, how long is this guy going to be a problem? They're not listening, and they're not submitting to his commands anymore. There's a bit of a bit of a problem within the household of Pharaoh. They wouldn't do this on pain of death. They wouldn't challenge the Pharaoh's instructions. But they know that if they don't do that, they're going to die anyway. 
God's just said that he will wipe out all of the crops. They know that that's their only food source for an entire nation. So there's trouble internally in Pharaoh's palace. Regarding the last plague, the plague of hail, some of the Egyptians heeded Jehovah's warning of the coming hailstone. They shimmered Jehovah's voice and took measures to protect themselves and their animals, <coughs> slaves, and family members. So there's this division that's starting to form here among the people who actually recognize who God is and the people who want to follow Pharaoh's instructions. I think this is an interesting prophetic picture because we know that this is given so that we know what will happen in the future. Are the officials of the world going to start realizing who God is and start moving away from what they're commanded by um, the Pharaoh, by the people in the world with the power? It certainly seems so. They thereby escaped the plague entirely, while the countrymen who followed Pharaoh's leadership suffered great loss. And you can see that this would happen again in the future. The series of events was a PR nightmare for Pharaoh the exact phrase he used, which common sense would tell us gave rise to much division and dissent. It doesn't say in the text that there was division and dissent, it just says that they started questioning his leadership. <coughs> common sense would tell us if God had started bringing all these plagues that some of the people would have been saying, look, this is a really bad idea, we shouldn't be following Pharaoh. Some of the people who stood by Pharaoh, they were saying, oh, he's God, we're going to follow after him. Moshe and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go serve Jehovah your God, but who are they that shall go? So he's saying, Okay, well, I'll let you go, but I'm still going to retain some element of control over this. Who's going to go? I'll dictate that. And Moshe said, We will go with our young, and with our old, and with our sons, and with our daughters, with our flocks, and with our herds will we go. For we must hold a feast unto Jehovah. And he said unto them, Let Jehovah be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve Jehovah, for that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. So he says, Okay, the men and the kids, they can go. The women and the cattle, they've got to stay here. So he's just trying to, trying to influence things still, still trying to show that he's in control. And Jehovah said unto Moses, unto Moses, stretch out thy hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herd of the land, even all that the hail hath left. And Moshe stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and Jehovah brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they before them, there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. So it's such the worst plague of locusts that there's ever been and ever will be. But they covered the face of the earth, so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herd of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees, or in the herds of the field, through all the land of Egypt. So it's literally as barren, as desolate, there was no food at all. Egypt was completely destroyed at this point. So with the arrival of the locust swarms, the last remaining food source of the country considered to be the breadbasket of the ancient world was gone. Egypt was the superpower of the ancient world. And I think when I read this, is this what's going to happen to America? See the food shortages happening in America now? Is this the state that America is going to be left in? It's going to be left completely desolate because of the judgment of God. This happened just before the first Passover, so it would have been just as the crops were about to be harvested. So as they've had this plague, plague of hail, it's destroyed all their livestock, they'd be thinking, well, the, the crops are just about to be harvested, they're just about to be ready to be eaten, so it's not the worst thing that could happen. Just as they were about to be harvested, God destroys the entire lot of them. Now, we see that there's a parallel to this plague of locusts in Revelation, Revelation 9, 3 to 10 says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth had power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing. So the locusts in Egypt destroyed all of the grass of the earth, all the green things. These, these are different, they're supernaturally empowered. Neither any tree, but only those men 
which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of the scorpion when he striketh the man. So these are different. These are supernatural locusts. And the ones that are told to leave alone are the ones with the seal of God in their foreheads. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. There's a lot of speculation about this verse. People say, well, our DNA is going to be changed and we're not going to be able to die. But I don't, I don't see that personally. I think that there'd always be a way for you to kill yourself if you wanted to, no matter how much your body had changed. There'd always be a way for you to kill yourself. I think what this is talking about is when the locusts come out and they sting people, that they're paralyzed. And so they have all of this pain, but they're paralyzed and they can't kill themselves. So that's why I think this is talking about the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And people look at these three verses and they say, right, these are helicopters. Okay, these locusts, it's just the way that John would describe these things. The faces were as the faces of men, obviously, when John was looking at them, you can see the pilots in the cockpit, and they had the hair of women, that was the roses that were shimmering, and they had breastplates, the breastplates of iron, that's the iron of the helicopters, and the sound of the wings was the sound of the roses. But I can't see that at all in the text, I think that's just pure speculation. If we go back, it says that they couldn't kill the people who had the seal of God in their foreheads. So that's not helicopters to me. But when they they would torment men for five months and it, the pain would be as a scorpion when you strike at the man. That's not helicopters either. If a helicopter shoots you with one of its big 120 millimeter bullets, that's not like being stung by a scorpion. And it wouldn't be a case that men would seek death, but death shall flee from them. So all of that is kind of men trying to understand something that's supernatural. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and they were they had stings in their tails and the power was to hurt men five months. Okay, back to Exodus. It says, Then Pharaoh called for Moshe and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against Jehovah your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once and entreat Jehovah your God, and he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated Jehovah. And Jehovah turned a mighty strong west wind and took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. But Jehovah hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And Jehovah said unto Moshe, Stretch out thine hand toward the heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Okay, so this is... In some way, it's palpable, this darkness. And Moshe stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. And people will say that this is the same sort of darkness when um, this demon is present. People say that the, the darkness is tangible when this demon's there. I'm not sure whether the, that is the darkness that Jehovah would send upon the land or not. Well, it's certainly a possibility, but there's something tangible about the darkness. There's something that you can actually feel. Um, it's not normal darkness, it's supernatural. They saw not one another, neither rose any from this place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Now this is important because this Jehovah is the children of Israel's light source. He gives them light and we see that there is precedent for that um, in scripture. In Revelation 6.12 it says, And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So in the future, this feast, and um, this plague, sorry, is prophetic of this darkness that will come on the land. When this darkness comes upon the land, Facebook, media, entertainment, philosophy, human government, and institutionalized religion will all be clearly seen as the laughable absurdity they really are. And we've got eyes to see. We can debate with people that these things are stupid, but they're not going to see it. When everything becomes dark, when all the things that they've relied on, all the things in their life 
which is taken away from them. Then they'll see that they were absurd, that they were stupid, that the one who has the real power is Jehovah, but it will be too late at this point. This is the last thing that happens before the wrath of Jehovah is poured out. Now, it says in Revelation, Revelation 22, 5, there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So this is the people who are obedient to God. This is in um, eternity. Jehovah will be the light source, just as he was the light source for the Israelites when they were in Egypt. Isaiah 60, 19 talks about the same thing. It says, The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but Jehovah shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God, thy glory. I wonder what it's going to be like in the future, because we're used to things like lights casting shadows because things have a source of light so if you stand in the path of the source of light it casts a shadow but if light just comes from all around if Jehovah is the source of light then there's not going to be any shadows in in eternity so they had a little taste of this they had a little taste of Jehovah's power they saw who he was and it was building their faith in him so the Israelites were becoming convinced that he really was going to do all the things he promised to do this is a promise that we have in the future. Things are going to get pretty dark in the world. And we'll be able to rely on Jehovah. We'll be under his protection. But this is the promise that we've got to look forward to. Song of Solomon 2, 10 to 12 speaks of the time after the darkness. It says, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come. It's an amazing promise that we've got to look forward to. And Jehovah is building our faith. He's bringing us back to kind of interpret in the scriptures more literally. It's not just kind of the philosophy that you live your life by. We start to see that things like this are coming very, very soon. Verse 24 says, And Pharaoh called unto Moshe and said, Go ye, serve Jehovah, only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moshe said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto Jehovah our God. Our cattle shall go with us. There shall not be a hoof left behind. For thereof must we take to serve Jehovah our God. For we know not with what we must serve Jehovah until we come to her. So basically, Pharaoh is saying, right, okay, you can go now. The only thing that you have to leave behind is your cattle and Moshe turns around to him and says okay leave, leave the cattle you just give us cattle because we're going to have to sacrifice oh wait there you've got no cattle have you because you disobeyed Jehovah so what we're going to have to do is take our cattle with us as well but Jehovah hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go and Pharaoh said unto him get thee from me take heed to thyself see my face no more for in that day Thou seest my face, thou shalt surely die. Sorry, Jesus. Yeah, thou shalt die. And Moshe said, Thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. So the Pharaoh cast Moshe out of his presence. He's sick of him now. He sees really that he's going to have to listen to God. But his pride's just getting in the way. So he said, Go away from me. I don't even want to see you now. I don't want to hear anything from you, God. Come to me again. I'm going to die. So in Goshen, something different was happening to the Israelites. A different process was happening. As Egypt was seeing that it was more and more desperate that they had no chance against this God, it was encouraging for the Israelites. Among the Israelite slaves, there is a growing awakening. These Israelite men and women had thought that they would live out all their days as Egyptians. This is happening now. There's a growing awakening to Jehovah's word. People not so long ago, 10, 20 years ago, saw that they were just a part of the world, that they were a part of Egypt. They would have just thought, we'll be slaves forever. You know, we're just going to have to submit to the system of the world. But something new is happening now. The hope is waking people up to their identity, waking people up to who they are. They had always known they were slaves, but at least they were privileged to be residents of the most powerful, most technologically advanced nation in the world. And I think this is a thought that's common as well. I know that I've had this thought. Yeah, we're slaves in the world, but at least we're not 
part of their grow country. At least we kind of got the comforts of Egypt around us. Work within the system and improve it was the counsel of the elders. And this is, you know, this is the philosophy of people today. We we a part of Egypt, but you know we'll do our thing and we'll be, we'll do what's right and maybe we can bring about a little bit of change within the world. That was the only option as they saw it. They didn't see it. They just had to cry out to Jehovah. They did not hope for anything more than that. But the events which have taken place over the past few weeks have caused them to rethink their future in Egypt. I mean, the, the events of the past couple of years have certainly made me rethink my position in the world, made me rethink my future in Egypt. Perhaps they had too quickly accepted Pharaoh as their provider, Egypt's technology as their hope for advancement, and Egypt as their home. Do we really want to spend our lives working within a system that has fallen apart? It seems right before our eyes. Everything now is just on the brink of going down the blood hole. Russia's just pulled out of the petrodollar. The entire economy of the world is at stake. Is that what we want to stake our hopes in? Is that what we, we want our future to be a part of that system? Or do we want what you have is giving us a chance to escape that? He'll protect us as everything falls apart around our ears. Was there perhaps a larger, grander destiny for the Israelites and their children? This is something that we're waking up to now. Now that work had stopped in Egypt for several weeks due to the plagues, and they were free of the bondage of slavery, they were rediscovering the joy of what it means to be Hebrew. Where are we discovering the joy of what it means to be Hebrew now? We're seeing that God's ways are in fact amazing. We don't want the ways of the world. That's rubbish. That's all passing away. It's all falling apart. At the time that that's happening, God is there to reassure all his people and say, oh, just follow my ways, just follow my word. He gives them hope. doesn't just leave them in a desolate situation. They began to think about and look at life hebraically again. They began to see the wonder of creation again when just a few days ago they were distracted by the grandeur of Pharaoh's world. A sense of family and community had returned to traditional values and ancient patriarchal ways that had been abandoned for the Egyptian lifestyle returned. Any of this sound familiar? You can imagine parents retelling stories they had learned from their grandfathers. Stories of men like Adam and Noah and Shem, Abraham and Sarah and Lot, Isaac and Rebecca and Laban, Jacob and Esau, Rachel and Leah, Joseph and his brothers. Imagine the Torah being retold again, just as it is being now. You can start to see the pattern of all these things. We start to talk about all of these men. People start to come back to what the truth is. Same pattern that was then, it's repeated exactly now. The, Israel, the children of Israel began to see a great vision, and the greatest story that Egypt had ever offered anyone. We were kind of blind, we had limited vision about what was possible for the future. Now we start to see that Jehovah is working in the world, he's bringing us out. We're going to the promised land. Their indentured servitude to a pagan mindset, death obsessed culture was about to end. Our servitude to the pagan ways, the pagan traditions within the church, death obsessed culture as well. I know that when I became a Christian, slowly over time I started to realize that the clothes that I was wearing were like covered in skulls and stuff. It just wasn't something that I, I processed before. But the culture that we live in now is very, very much like the culture of Egypt then. Follow the pagan ways. It's all kind of death obsessed. It's all violent video games, violent movies, horror movies and stuff. It's all focused around death. It all glorifies Hasitan. And they were about to leave for the promised land. Exodus 11 says, and Jehovah said unto Moshe, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor, and every woman of her neighbor, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And Jehovah gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, man, Moshe was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So Moses, far from being someone that they didn't like, he brought all of these plagues. Or could be seen that he brought all of these plagues on the people. They started to respect him. They started to see that he served 
most high God, and this is what happens as we start to walk and we're walking in Yahuwah's ways, we're the light of the world, they start to actually respect what we're doing. Proverbs 3, 3 to 6 says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them on the table of thy heart, for shalt thou, uh, so shalt thou find favour and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in Yehovah with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct their paths. So all of these people in Egypt, all of the Israelites, after all of these plagues had come on the land, the Israelites probably weren't very popular. What they were told to do, in fact, was to go out and ask the Egyptians if they could just borrow their gold. Now, that probably to their minds didn't seem like the wisest thing to do. It didn't seem like it was going to work. But they shamed, they trusted, and they obeyed what Jehovah said to do. Now, this over them taking the gold out of Egypt, this often we read the, the Torah and we can think, okay, you know, this is a story, but is there any actual evidence of it happening? Now, this is a guy who's a political scientist in Egypt, and he's talking about um, how the Israelites stole the gold from Egypt and how they should pay it back with interest and how they know that Moses was there. So they, they know this, they teach this as history in Egypt. Let's have a look at what he's got to say. Oh. هو إثبات الحق التاريخي المزعوم في الأراضي المصرية. نحن نعلم تماما أن سيدنا موسى كان في هذا البلد. وإذا خرج اليهود اليهود أولا هم كانوا يريدون تعويضات بعشرات المليارات من الدولارات في بلد اقتصاده متوحد. نمرة اثنين أن الأهم من التعويضات هو إثبات الحق التاريخي المزعوم في الأراضي المصرية. نحن نعلم تماما أن سيدنا موسى كان في هذا البلد. وحين خرج اليهود من هذا البلد خرجوا خرج في التيه الذي جرى في سيناء أولئك الذين كفروا أو غضبوا من دعوة موسى وأغضبوه في الغالب العام. وهم خارجون نهب ذهب مصر وثروات مصر. بل كثير من الدراسات التي نشأت حول الأداء الاقتصادي لليهود في التاريخ المصري وعلى التوازي في التاريخ الإنساني كله يعني مسرحية شايلوك أو مسرحية شخصية شايلوك في تاجر البندقية الشخصية هي شخصية اليهود الذي كان في مصر وذلك الشخص الذي يتاجر ويرابي ويحصل على الفوائد ولا يعيد استثمارها في البلد إنما يضعها في الخارج عشان كده اليهود طول الوقت كانوا بينهبوا هذا البلد نهب مصر ابتداء من سرقه ذهب مصر في ايام سيدنا موسى وصولا الى قبل ثوره 52 ما كانوا يفعلون في يفعلون بالاقتصاد المصري. العريان يقول كده انا قلت له لا بالعكس ده احنا نطالبهم باسترداد ثرواتنا التي نهبوها بفقد القيمه الذي غلوه من الاقتصاد المصري على مدار so they know that the Israelites were there and obviously that had quite an anti-Semitic vibe to it but they recognize that the Israelites were there and they say the gold that they stole that we know that they stole they need to return now they need to return it not only the gold but with interest interesting 
And Moshe said, Thus saith Jehovah, and about midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Egypt that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, all the firstborn of the beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, against man or beast, that ye may know that I am Jehovah, and put a difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me, and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And Jehovah said unto Moshe, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moshe and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and Jehovah hardened the Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of this land. So this passage and the one previous have seemed to be largely about the judgment of Egypt. But both this and the prophetic picture it's painting are about something larger and more important. So it's not about the judgment of Egypt. What's coming is not about the judgment of the world. It's kind of a byproduct of what's going to happen. What it's actually about is establishing a covenant people for Jehovah. He's doing all these things for a specific purpose. He's not just doing it to punish the wicked. He's doing it so that he's got people who will listen to his voice. It's about the establishment of a covenant people for Jehovah who will shema his word. What does it mean to shema? We use this word all the time when we say hear and obey or trust and obey. Well, let's have a look at it. Shema is a very common uh, verb in the Hebrew language. Western minds, however, have a really hard time with this verb. Sometimes our Bibles translate it as listen, sometimes as hear, and sometimes as obey. The English language does not have a word that satisfactorily translates Shema. That's because of the nature of the Western mind, which equates verbs only with bodily actions with what you do, as opposed to the functioning of our spirit and our soul. The Hebrew language has got these things built into it because they've got an understanding of these things. To a Western culture, what our spirit or what our soul does is irrelevant, it's just what our body kind of does, so what we've got with our language is the best way that we can kind of interpret it and understand it, we hear the words that are said, we obey, it's all kind of very physical. The English words hear, listen and obey all describe only outward physical responses to external stimuli. To Shema deals with the effect of such stimuli at a much deeper level than our outward actions. It describes the effects of Jehovah's word on the inner being, that's what its focus is. Jehovah's words all have creative and prophetic power. Part of how he created things like let light be, they've got power behind them. To Shema describes the change that takes place from the inside out. So it's not about your outward actions, it's about the change that's brought about inside that causes you to change what you do outwardly. This is what Jehovah wants in his people. He wants people who will listen to his words and they will change them inside and then as a result of that they will hear and obey his words. In Genesis 2 16 to 17 it says and Jehovah God commanded the man saying of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay, so there's two commands there, or two uh, commands that are less subtle that are anyway. Any, anyone say what those commands are? Actually, the more subtle of the three. Okay, there's three different commands that are given. Mitzvah 1, commandment 1, the prototype for all positive mitzvot, all positive commandments. Positive commandment is when you say to do something, it's a positive act. The negative commandment is when you say not to do something. Okay, this was to eat freely of every tree in the garden, including the tree of life. That was how they were to sustain themselves. They were commanded that that's what they were to eat. Mitzvah 2 was the prototype for all negative mitzvot. This is not to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a more subtle one there. 
mitzvah three was the prototype for all mitzvot that tell us about how to approach life. There's things all throughout the Torah that tell us more subtly about our relationship to Jehovah. This was to live all of life from the fundamental understanding that for a human being to shemar the words of the Creator and to walk in them is to experience real life, while to lo shemar, to disobey the words of the Creator and choose to pursue what one's flesh craves and or one's deceived mind or culture thinks or says will bring pleasure is to enter the realm of death. Okay, so more subtly tells you that. Do what the Creator says, that will bring life. If you choose to disobey the fact that you said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then that will bring death. Okay, the Shema itself, this is something that Israelites are very familiar with. Um, so if we have a look at the text of this, this tells us quite a lot about how we are to live in relationship with Jehovah. Deuteronomy 6, 4-9 says, Hear the word is Shema there, O Israel, Jehovah our God, this one Lord. And thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Okay, so... This is the Shema lifestyle that Jehovah is calling all of these people to when he gives them all of the commandments um, at Sinai. This is how he wants them to respond to them. He's saying, look, I want you to reverence me when I say something. I want you to see it as the words of life. I want you to worship me in this way by the way that you live your lives. Teach them to your children. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Now, we'll see in in a little bit that this is actually talking about what you do and what you think. Obviously the Orthodox Jews will have a little box with the Shema um, on their hands and on their foreheads. It's not actually physically possible to write out all of the commandments and then bind them on your head and bind them on your hand. So this is talking about something else, but we'll see that in a verse in a bit. And thou shalt write them on the posts of thy house and on thy gates. How you conduct your household, it's all supposed to be according to the Torah. So these are the Shema people that Jehovah wants. He wants people who will run the households, what they do, what they think, what they teach their children. He wants all of it to be in, a, in alignment with his Torah. So as part of getting out of Egypt, the Israelites had to return to the calendar of the Creator. This is what we're going to go into now. We have returned to the calendar of the Creator and seeing his calendar is important in seeing how he views the world. It kind of brings us back more into alignment, takes us away from the world's view, way of viewing things to the Creator's way of viewing things. There's obviously, there's all different ideas to the Creator's calendar. There's the calendar in Enoch, there's the sliver of the moon, the conjunction of the moon. That's not what's important. We follow the uh, conjunction of the moon because the creator knows when there's a new moon in the sky. So we follow that because he says when there's a new moon in the sky, then it's the new month. Don't go off. The sliver of the moon is cited by man because Jehovah doesn't view things as man views it. But there's no saying who's right and who's wrong. What's important is that you shema the command that says on the first day of the month, do this. Or on the 14th day of the month, do that. So whatever day you think that is, as long as you're following that command, that's what's important. We no longer live by the calendar of the nations of the world. This is what's truly important about the calendar. We learn to view time from his perspective instead of the perspective of man. And we thereby demonstrate to the rest of the nations and people of the world what it means to relate properly to the medium of creation called time. And we can actually teach them the gospel through things like his Melodium. It's the entire story of salvation. So as the world sees us living these things out, we get to speak to them about the gospel. We get to tell them why we're doing these things. So they'll actually see the sense in what we're doing, basically. And we learn about his appointed times and we'll know when he will bring about significant events. And we also know what sort of events they'll be because we know 
what is appointed time for the vows, what they signify. Okay. Um, speaking about appointed times, I think it's just about time to have some tea. <laughs> <laughs> this 12. And Jehovah spake unto Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So the command is set forth at this point. This is the first day of the month, the first day of the new year. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, the tenth of Nisan, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbour next unto his house take it according to the number of souls that every man according to his evening shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, he shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and he shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, the upper door posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. Now this word that's translated as lamb here is in Hebrew, it's say. And I think the reason that it's translated as lamb is because obviously we know what it points to, what the prophetic picture of is of. But it talks about an animal of a flock. Any flock of animals, an animal that's taken out of that flock, the word is say can mean lamb, doesn't necessarily. Now all of this, the prophetic significance of this will go into detail about when it's actually Passover, when we're, we're doing Passover. But Torah shows that it is the act of taking the say, the appro then procreating unto oneself and one's household and trusting in the say's spilled blood, which is the exclusive means by which we become set apart unto Jehovah and engrafted into the covenant. You'll notice that they've not received the Torah on Mount Sinai at this point. That's not the means by which they're saved. They're saved by the blood of the Lamb. The observance of commandments, the performance of specific laws and statutes of the Torah, and the participation in the Moedim and the Shabbat are only natural outgrowths of the covenant, behaviors consistent with and in furtherance of the covenant. Obviously, this is not the means by which we're saved. Once we're saved, though, once we have faith in the Creator, obviously we're going to hunger and thirst at His uh, commandments. They're not what we do to be saved. They just demonstrate the faith by which we are saved and brought close to God through the blood of the saint. Neither circumcision nor Torah submission are the way to eternal life. So obviously there's a massive debate in the first century about is this how we're saved? Do we follow all of the Torah? The Israelites weren't saved like that, they were saved with the blood of the Lamb. To the contrary, if we properly understood, Torah submission is just a lifestyle of those who have already received eternal life. The distinction which will be drawn by Jehovah regarding the final deadly plague will, simply put, be between those who shimar the word of Jehovah and anoint the doorposts of their home with the blood of the Passover Lamb, which is Yeshua. On the other hand, and, um, and those who lo shimar the word of Jehovah, who disobey the word of Jehovah, do not anoint their doorposts with the blood on the other. That's where the division will be drawn. Those who shimar the word of Jehovah, whatever their physical nationality, will be considered as Israel. And those who lo shimar the word of Jehovah, whatever their physical lineage, will be considered as Egypt. So it doesn't matter if someone is born Jewish, if they're born in Israel, that's not all the time matter for them being considered as Israel. What matters is whether you shema the word of Jehovah. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head and his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste, it is Jehovah's Passover. Okay, so there's multiple commandments there. This is what he instructs people to do. On the tenth day after the new moon, Jehovah has called the beginning of years, 
select the lamp and take the lamp into your hands. Let the lamp dwell with you in your home for four days, then slaughter it at the appointed time at evening on the fourteenth day of the month. Put some of the blood of the lamb on the lintel on the two side posts that you thought you dwell in to serve as a sign that you have shamed his instructions. Remain in your homes and stand clad in sandals and with staff in hand while you and your, all your family members eat a special meal of the flesh of the lamb in the merit of whose blood he agreed to pass over our houses. Do not eat the flesh of the lamb raw, but eat it boiled instead, roast it. Eat all of it. Do not throw any of it away. And this gives us prophetic pictures as well. But let nothing of it remain part, might be a reference to not letting any of Yeshua's flesh, the word, he is the word made flesh, uneaten. We've got to take it all. To partake of the sacrifice a second time would also give us an incorrect picture of salvation. The one who is pictured, Yeshua, will be sacrificed once and for all if we were to partake of the sacrifice over and over again it would give us the incorrect picture as we're burning it ash cannot decompose any further than its current state obviously Yeshua didn't decompose he was the bread of life the holy one who would not see decay or corruption leaven corrupts the dough as it causes the bread to rise he was our bread of life he was our unleavened bread Yeshua's flesh saw no corruption no decay so the lamb's body is actually rendered in a state of being incapable of being corrupted by the burning. Now this command is designed to make them um, think of when they left Egypt. So that's the significance that it would have had to the Israelites. But we, the significance that it has to us, can also remember our leaving of the world, our leaving is of Egypt and the sacrifice by which it was made possible. This is also illustrative of the believer's preparedness to act on Jehovah's instructions at a moment's notice, and the fact that they had to be clothed and ready to go. The command to roast the lamb's flesh, the word, is symbolic of using the ruach, the fire, to illuminate the word. So you've got the flesh of the lamb, the word, illuminated by the ruach, the fire. Fire will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment, I am Jehovah. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses which ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to Jehovah. Throughout your generations ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So anyone that calls himself Israel is to keep this ordinance of the Lord. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. And in the second day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them save that which every man must eat and um, that only may be done of you and you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread for in the self same day i have brought your armies out of the land of egypt therefore you shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever so the feast of unleavened bread lasts for seven days first day seventh day the high sabbaths in the first month on the 14th day of the month at the end at the evening sorry you shall eat the unleavened bread until the one of the twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leavened in your habitations, ye shall eat unleavened bread. So when it's talking about leavened or unleavened, what leaven was is they took some of the dough from the previous day's batch and they would add it into their dough and that was what would um, cause the dough to rise. We would think of it as adding yeast to the dough today. So when we observe this, we remove anything that's leavened, anything that's got yeast, anything that caused it to rise from our house. Um, then Moshe called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families. 
kill the Passover, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. So, it wasn't just that they put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, the, there's a command that follows that command that they've got to obey that they don't leave the house until morning. You see in 1 Peter 1, 1 to 2, it says, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the full knowledge of God the Father, through th- sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling the blood of Yeshua the Messiah. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So in both cases, there's the sprinkling of the blood of the Passover lamb, but that is also accompanied by obedience. Okay, they would if they just put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and then they went out of the house, this angel of death would have come and killed them. So there's an element of obedience there. For Jehovah will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood on the lintel, and on the side posts, Jehovah will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. I think the use of the language there, the destroyer, when suffer the destroyer to come in, is very, very um, provocative when you read Revelation. Revelation 9 11 says, And they had the king over them. This is the locusts that come up from the bottomless pit that this is talking about. They had the king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name. Colin. Both of those names mean the destroyer. So I think this is talking about exactly the same thing. What we have in Exodus, this destroyer in Exodus is the same destroyer that will come with the plague of locusts. He'll be the king, the angel of, of the bottomless pit in the last days. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which ye hope will give you according as he has promised um, that ye shall keep this service and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you what mean ye by this service that ye shall say it is the sacrifice of Jehovah's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshipped obviously this is a picture of as we are set free by the blood of the Lamb we pass this knowledge on to the generations to come. And the children of Israel went away and did as Jehovah commanded Moshe and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass that at midnight Jehovah uh, smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. It's an important thing to recognize here. Jehovah does not inflict the judgment of death on human beings without good reason. The flood, all flesh was corrupted. It, it got to get to a really bad point where Jehovah's got no choice basically but to inflict this judgment on people. They won't listen to uh, him telling them to repent. You know, when um, Jonah was sent to Nineveh, he told them to repent and they did repent and it wasn't destroyed. This is just what happens when people get to the point where they just completely ignore God God has to act. Before he ever does such a thing, he will always provide a clear and ample way of escape for all who will listen to his voice and heed his warnings. It's just his nature and his way. He doesn't want to bring about death. It's not what he's about at all. He's about life. The effect of not being covered by the blood of the Lamb will be the death of many people again in the future, unfortunately. When the darkness of the sixth seal is passed and the seventh seal is opened and the wrath of the Lamb poured out, the blood of the winepress of this wrath will rise to the bridle on his horse. So there will be death, there will be destruction as well again, but it's not because this is what Jehovah wants to do. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moshe and Aaron by night, and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people. Both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve Jehovah as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people, that they might send them 
out of the land of haste, but it says, we be all dead men. So he really recognizes at this point the power that God has. He doesn't just say, go. He says, change the situation in Egypt. Instead, use this, the power of this God to bless me. Don't leave me in this situation. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, and even kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moshe, and borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And Jehovah gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent them unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians of Egypt. Desolate anyway, they didn't have any food, but they took even all of the treasure with them when they left. We put ourselves in the position of these people when they're actually leaving, in the minds of the slaves that were leave, leaving Egypt. They weren't just kind of leaving Egypt, leaving um, servitude and bondage. That would be a good thing. But think about what's actually going on in their minds as they leave. The future is really uncertain to them. They think, we're in a bad position in slavery, but what is it that we're actually going to now? We're just following God by faith. So you're a slave suddenly set free after a lifetime of servitude. Imagine you now have no place to stay. You now have no way to earn a living. You now have no way to know where you would go into or how long it would be before you get there. Imagine you face the future with no way to feed yourself or your children except with whatever you can carry on your back and your shoulders as you take your leave. This is the position that we are going to be in. At the moment, we can kind of look to Egypt to provide some kind of provision, some sustenance for us. But we're going to be put in a position where we've just got to rely on Jehovah. Verse 37 says, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot. There were men beside children. Okay. You consider that male Hebrew children have been under a death sentence for over 80 years realize that women far outnumbered the men. Okay, it's believed that between two million and three million uh, Hebrew people, including men, women and children, left Egypt together. Okay, so this is a massive group of people. Six hundred thousand is a lot of people, but well, that's just the men. They're just the older men as well. And a mixed multitude went up also with them from flocks and herds, even very much cattle. So this is people, um, Egyptians, that recognize that Jehovah is. It's also the other slave peoples um, that were in servitude in Egypt. They all left at this time. But the point here is that it's not just Israelites, natural born Israelites that are leaving. This is a mixed multitude. There's people of all different nations left right at the beginning. It wasn't that the Gentiles were grafted in um, just in the New Testament. They've always been grafted in. As long as people are willing to shimar the word of Jehovah, they've always been grafted in. They've always been welcome to be a part of Israel. Contrary to popular opinion, it was not only natural Israel that was delivered out of Egypt. As the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob marched out of the land of the pyramids, they were joined by a mixed multitude of people from many nations who decided it was time to leave Egypt as well. Now, we see that this is actually prophesied to happen again. People will recognize that there's something that Israel's got that they want. Zechariah 8, 20 to 23 says, Thus saith Jehovah said, Lord, it shall, come, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before Jehovah and to seek Jehovah said, Lord, I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek Jehovah said, Lord, in Jerusalem and to pray before Jehovah. Thus saith Jehovah said, Lord, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Okay, so this prophesied to happen again. This is... Um, it's got symbolic significance to ten men, obviously speaking about the ten lost tribes of the house of Israel. Where it says there, they'll take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. More accurately translated, they take hold of their seat seat and they say, we know that you've been doing God's commandments, basically teach us about God. And this is obviously what you see happening at the moment. People look 
to the Jews and they look at how they're doing things because they've been doing things for a lot longer than we have. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had prepared themselves any victual. Now this journey with the children of, it, of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day that it came to pass, that all the hosts of Jehovah went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be observed unto Jehovah for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is the night of Jehovah to be observed of all the children of Israel and their generations. And Jehovah said unto Moshe and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is, brought, that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. People will look at this commandment and they'll say, well, should people who are uncircumcised, should they eat of the Passover meal or not? But well, we've got to remember that this was a lamb that was sacrificed. Okay, what we eat during the Passover meal isn't a lamb that was sacrificed. Obviously, circumcision is important. We've all got it in our hearts to be circumcised. But I don't see this as a prohibition against eating the Passover meal, taking part of it if you're not circumcised. Look at things like Acts 15, where it says people are saved, people partake of the Passover lamb before they're circumcised. That was what the entire argument was about. Are they saved when they're circumcised, or are they saved afterwards? And before they're circumcised. So I see the scripture tells us clearly, don't make it difficult for people to come. Don't stop them observing and worshiping God. Instead, they'll come to it bit by bit. And when a stranger shall see join with thee, and will keep the Passover to Jehovah, let all his males be circumcised, um, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. This is always the way that it is with the Holy Law. It doesn't have different laws for different groups of people. Well, these are the Gentiles that have come into covenant, so we've got one law for them, and these are the Jews, so we've got one law for them. No, it's the same for natural born Israelites and the stranger that sojourneth among them. Thus did all the children of Israel as Jehovah commanded Moshe and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass the self same day that Jehovah did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. And Jehovah spake unto Moshe, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whosoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moshe said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand Jehovah brought you out from this place, there shall no unleavened bread be eaten. This day came you out in the month of the year. It's the, the first month of the year, it's the month of Nisan. Now, Jehovah is saying that the firstborn has to be sanctified unto him. And we'll see what that means. Basically, if an animal was born, if the firstborn of an animal was born, it would have to be sanctified. Have to be sacrificed unto Jehovah. If an unclean animal had the firstborn child, then a lamb would be used to redeem that firstborn. Same with human beings. If a human being was born, then um, they would be redeemed by a lamb. And it shall be when Jehovah shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days shalt thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to Jehovah. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no unleavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. So in about two months' time is Passover unleavened bread, and we'll go through all of this in detail then, but there's some uh, kind of important things that we can we can pick out from this. 
And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which Jehovah did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. So that's what they're commanded um, as how to commemorate this. They said, This is how Jehovah brought us out. This is how we remember it. All of the commandments about how to celebrate it, they all tell us something about that. But in Judaism, the unleavened bread that they eat is something that's called matzah. There's a picture of it there. They want it to cook rapidly so the airborne yeast does not begin to ferment. So even if they don't have leaven in it, the yeast that's in the air will cause the, the dough to rise. If they leave it long enough, it will cause the dough to rise. They want to avoid that, obviously. It is holes throughout and is cooked on raised platforms, which causes it to have scorch marks and lines across it. So it's got across it those scorch marks, the lines of the scorch marks, and it's got lots of holes in it as well. The rabbis actually say that matzah must be striped and pierced for it to be kosher. They don't know what they're saying. They don't know the Messiah. They don't know anything about it. But when the Jews come to this knowledge of the Messiah, all of these things, all of the pictures that they've had all over time, it will all start to sink into place for them. They will come to a knowledge of the Messiah a lot quicker than we can learn about him because they've been learning about him for their entire lives. And it shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that Jehovah's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand Jehovah hath brought thee out of Egypt. And thou shalt keep this ordinance in a season from year to year. So we see that this is figurative. It doesn't mean get Jehovah's law, write down all the commandments and put it in your mouth. Just like it doesn't mean when it says bind them on your forehead and bind them on your hands, to actually write them out and bind them on your forehead and on your hands. There's, there is figurative language that's used there. And it shall be when Jehovah shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto Jehovah all the open of the matrix, and every first thing that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the males shall be Jehovah's. So this is this thing of the animals being sacrificed <coughs> to Jehovah. And every first thing of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, because a, a donkey is an unclean animal. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break its neck. A lot of this thing with the sacrifices, it shows us just how terrible sin is. It's kind of a physical way for us to understand things and say, look, if you were not redeem the animal, if you, if you don't think that the donkey is important, then you're going to have to kill it. Look, if you won't give a lamb for it, then you're going to have to kill it. And all the firstborn of man among the children shall be uh, redeemed. <coughs> and it shall be when the son asketh thee in the time to come, saying, what is this that thou shalt say unto him? By strength of hand, Jehovah brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass when, Jehovah, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that Jehovah slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beasts. Therefore I sacrifice to Jehovah all that openeth the matrix, being males for all the firstborn of my children, I redeem. So in order to remember, Firstborn that were killed, when a firstborn was born, then it's um, sanctified unto Jehovah. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand, and for frontlets between thine eyes, and by strength of hand Jehovah brought us forth out of Egypt. So when it says that this command be to sanctify all the firstborn, it should be on your forehead and it should be on your hand. Obviously, we can't literally put a sacrifice on our hands and on our foreheads. It's talking figuratively, so we can see from this verse when it says the front that's between your eyes and on your hands, it's not talking literal, it's just talking figuratively. Shall we pray?